present. Um, my name is Matt Schumann. I work on the programming team here at Cary Library. Um, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that this program was made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. Um, please let myself or Christine know uh, if there are any technical difficulties. Um, we recommend muting yourself unless if you're actively speaking as there can unfortunately be audio feedback issues with Zoom. Um, we're also recording uh, today's event. So um, if you are not comfortable having your uh, video in the recording, um, we recommend stopping the video, but you're welcome to keep your audio on to discuss and ask questions. Uh, with us today, as you can see, is Tess Gerritsen, an internationally best-selling and multiple award-winning author of numerous thrillers. Her series of novels featuring Jane Rizzoli and Maura Isles inspired the TNT television series Rizzoli and Isles. So please welcome Tess Gerritsen. Hi. I hope everyone's doing well in this, uh, during this age of the pandemic. I can, I, all I can say is I spent yesterday picking dandelions uh, because I'm trying to make dandelion wine for the very first time. Boy, was that not worth it. <laughs> you need like a quart of just the petals. And so I spent all day and my fingers were stained yellow. So that's what I'm doing during the pandemic. I hope you're all enjoying yourselves too. I've been reading lots of books online, but I have to say I miss having paper books. I'm looking forward to the library opening. I, you know, I do too. Um, I'm doing everything pretty much by iPad. Um, and I think though, that this is going to be a very creative time for most writers around the country. Um, as they say, Shakespeare wrote some of his best plays during, during their, their years of the play. So maybe something good will come out of this from all the writers I know. Certainly, I know a lot of screenwriters are busy at work doing things that uh, they wouldn't have time to do normally uh, because production shut down. So um, I think it's very similar for novelists as well. Um, Matt, did you want to um, have me give a little talk or should I just take questions or what would you prefer? Well, um, since this is the uh, book club, I guess it's up to um, all of you how you want to, I'm sorry to defer it back onto the group, but um, I don't know if you want to talk maybe for a little bit and then open it up to questions, but I don't know if people already have stuff that they want to talk about either. Um, yeah, so it's kind of weird for me to, to do this long distance. <laughs> I'm just so used to getting up in front of a, an audience and just giving a little talk. So um, anyway, what I can say is that I am, I live in Maine. Um, it's very beautiful up here right now. The weather's changing and um, we're hanging in there. Um, as far as the writing goes, I just finished a project which is really different for me. It's a collaboration with a, a, a Massachusetts author named Gary Braver. Um, we, we, I, I had this idea of addressing the Me Too movement, but from both the male and the female perspective. I thought it would be sort of interesting to see a novel about um, an illicit affair and see what the man thinks about it and what the woman thinks about it. So um, I suggested this idea and Gary said, I'll write the male point of view. So um, it is a thriller. It's about a, um, a college professor who's happily married, who unfortunately has an affair with one of his students and the student is found dead. Um, so he becomes a prime suspect. And I wrote the female points of view, including the student who dies, but also the female detective who comes in on the case after the body is found and starts to starts to circle in on this professor. And at the same time, you also see in intervening chapters what's going on in the professor's life, you know, how we see dealing with being the primary suspect and having his marriage fall apart and losing his job. So it was it was a really different kind of a project for me because I'm I'm usually kind of a control freak. <laughs> I had a little trouble um, having to deal with a co-writer, but I think that the, uh, the end result is, is, um, is pretty interesting. Um, I'm also working on a new Rizzolian Isles story. Um, I think I'm about a third of the way through it right now. It's, it's a little different because it focuses on Jane's mother. Um, I've always thought Jane's mom was a fun character, um, but as, a, as another middle-aged woman just like her, I'm sure she's not listened to very much. I think people tend to discount her opinions or uh, her observations. So Jane's mom thinks she's, she's witnessing a crime. 
and nobody believes her. And she calls her daughter and her daughter, her daughter just thinks, oh, it's, it's mom again, you know, doing her crazy thing. But um, is Angela correct? Has she actually seen a crime? So it's, it's in a way, it's, it's, um, it's taking the middle-aged female point of view, which I think is not seen enough in stories. And I, I love seeing somebody that I can identify with in terms, you know, in terms of my age group and also my gender. So that's the next Jane Rizzoli series. Um, and I guess I should talk a little bit about my most recent book, uh, which was The Shape of Night. I don't know how many of you have read it. If you have, you probably thought, what the heck did she do here? What was, where did this book come from? Um, it's one of those stories that, that I think resulted from my own background of loving ghost stories. Uh, my mom's very favorite TV show was The Ghost and Mrs. Muir. Um, and then there was that beautiful black and white movie, also The Ghost and Mrs. Muir. And uh, the setup, of the, uh, for those of you who never watched the show or saw the movie, it's about uh, a young widow who moves into a house that's haunted by the old sea captain and they, they fall in love um, and what happens next. It's really a very sweet story, very chaste kind of love story. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to do that, but take it to the next level, have a murder involved, have, um, the, have the relationship between the ghost and, and the woman actually get to a physical level. Um, and that's where um, The Shape of Night came in. It's about a very troubled woman who rents a house on the coast of Maine, of course it's Maine, um, and she finds out that the house is haunted by a very, hap ha very handsome sea captain, um, and they fall in love. And she finds out also that every woman who's ever lived in the house has died in that house. So now the question is, is it the captain or is there a very human killer um, at work in this town? So that's, um, that was the background for The Shape of Night. Um, I have, a lot of other books that I would like to write. I just, you know, sometimes you just want to live long enough to be able to write them. Um, and it's, it's just an unending stream of creativity that I think is really being spurred on by, strangely enough, this pandemic where you're stuck at home, you can't go anywhere, you can't be distracted. Um, and the stories got, just keep coming. Um, so anyway, I'd love to take questions if anybody has any about The Shape of Night or the upcoming stories. And feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can. Everyone can unmute themselves and discuss things as well. I, I'd love to ask a question, if possible. Okay, you can hear me. That's good. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, I'm actually calling from uh, Manchester, UK. So hello. <laughs> um, I actually saw you do a, um, a talk about the Shape of Night um, at Bolton Library, um, probably a few maybe a year ago now. Yeah, a year ago. Yeah. Um, and you talked about then, um, actually, about the representation of more mature women and kind of how they were underrepresented and that you have some kind of project in mind to bring that to life. Yeah. Um, would that be what you were talking about with Jane's mother then, perhaps? That is one of them. But the other one that, I, that is sort of on the runway waiting to take off is, um, it's a story, it's actually about my small town. I live in a town where, for some weird reason, we have a lot of retired spies. And <laughs> I discovered that um, because on my little street where I used to live, we had a retired CIA agent um, at one end of the street and somebody from the OSS on the other. And I began to wonder, why are all these retired spies in my town? <laughs> um, what is it about my town that seems to attract everybody who used to be in foreign service and also in the CIA? Um, and then it went to the next level where I thought, I began to see in my own mind a retired spy, but she's a woman and maybe she's in her 50s or her 60s. And she's just a very capable woman who, um, who is now farming. She's a chicken farmer. She left, she left uh, the agency. Um, and now she gets called back to service for something that she doesn't really want to go back for. Um, and I love the idea of a gray haired woman who now everybody just thinks of as a chicken farmer strapping on the gun and going back to work. Um, uh, and what is it? In a way, the best spies would be women who are, who are middle-aged because people, they ignore us. You know, we can walk through a crowd and nobody pays attention to us. What better person to be there observing things uh, and not being noticed? So that was, that was the, I think I, that was the story I mentioned at Bolton Library that um, that was, 
that was uh, coming up and um, I already have a title for it. It's going to be called Spyville because it has to do with my town. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. We also have, um, as Mina said in um, the chat, that uh, you can ask questions there or you can just unmute yourself. But uh, there is a question um, from Christine that says, how did you first create the characters of Rizzoli and Isle? Um, so the first book in the series was The Surgeon. And if you've read that, you'll notice that Jane is not the main character in that story. She is a, um, she's a secondary character. She is a partner of the hero. Um, and at the very beginning, I just thought that Jane was going to die in that book. Um, I saw her from the very beginning as a sacrificial character. So I never bothered to make her likable. <laughs> and if you read that, um, you'll notice from the very beginning that Jane Rizzoli is not a likable person. Now, a lot of people say, oh, she's really a bitch. Why, you know, why do you make her the, the heroine? Um, but as I was writing the story, when I got to know more and more about who she is and how she thinks, I, I started to identify with her. And by the time I got to the scene where she was supposed to die, I just, I just couldn't do it. I thought, you fought so hard, you're so smart, you're so, um, you're so interesting, you need to live. So she survived the surgeon, and then I wanted to write a second book about her. I wanted to have a rematch between her and the villain, and that's where The Apprentice came in. So that's the next book in the series, and that's the book where I, I introduced uh, Dr. Maura Isles. And again, she was a sec secondary character, but she became more interesting to me as I was writing the story, and I wanted to write a third book and that became The Sinner. And that's, that's how the series all came about. It was really nothing planned ahead of time. It was just the characters kept pulling me forward and I wanted to find out what happened next. Um, and I think for me, the most interesting characters are the ones that I'm not paying attention to. They're the ones that you write off to the side and they sort of take on their own, their own personality and before you know it, they feel much more real to you than, um, than they started off with. So that's how Jane Rizzoli and Maura Isles came to be. They were not, it was not, um, it was not a planned series. Uh, and every book I've gone back to with those characters, it's always been because I wanted to know what was happening to them, what was, what was going on next. It's, it's, it's like re revisiting old friends for me. Any other questions? Um, this is Aileen. I, I was just going to ask, what mystery writers do, have influenced you or do you like to read? Um, I read The Surgeon and that's the, the, the first, that was my introduction to you. So I haven't really read any of the others yet in the series, but I'm just curious what, what you know, that type of writing, the thriller kept me on the edge of my seat. Um, you know, who, who's influenced you the most? <laughs> Well, you know, I go back to my childhood and I think about, it's, it's interesting because my, my favorite books when I was small were fantasy and I don't write fantasy. I don't think I'm smart enough to write fantasy. Um, but I love the idea of world building and bringing in a universe of characters that you so identify with, you don't want to let them go. And that would be going back to Nancy Drew. I mean, those were, I grew up reading those and the Tolkien books and I loved Isaac Asimov and I also loved romantic suspense and gothic novels. So I think that I, I, I would say I'm a pretty eclectic reader. I will read everything except anything to do with sports. It's just not my thing. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the surgeon, I would, I would say, I'm thinking back about what books maybe sit back and go, wow, that's, that's really exciting. I'd love to write a book like that. I would say Thomas Harris was, was a pretty big um, influence. Um, and uh, but mostly, I suppose it's just it's just my interest in science and medicine that um, that brought the surgeon forward. You know, before that, I was writing medical thrillers. I was known as a medical thriller author because I was a doctor, um, and the surgeon I I considered a medical thriller in a way because there's so much medicine involved in it. And it was only when everybody said, "No, this is actually a crime novel," that I realized I'd written a crime novel. Um, so if you look at I guess my writing career, it started off with romantic suspense, it went to medical thrillers, I've done science fiction, I've done historical novels. It's really all about what story is calling to me at the moment. Um, there's another question in chat of, uh, it says from Jane, everyone always asks, so I will too, what is your writing process? And second question, any daily routines or practices? 
Yeah. Um, well, the only thing that's unusual about me, I guess, is that I still, I'm an old dog. You can't treat, teach me new tricks. I still write my first drafts with pen and paper. I, uh, you know, I can type, I can type a hundred words a minute. That is not the problem. Um, the problem is that when I see my words on the screen, I want to continually edit and I never get past that page. And again, it probably has to go back to being a perfectionist in some way. Um, I want everything that I see to be perfect on the screen, but my handwriting is so bad that I can't see it. So it allows me to go forward and keep writing. Um, I think the only other thing I do that might be a little out of the ordinary is I have no idea where the book's going when I start. I mean, I just know it's a mystery. I know about who's going to survive and maybe who's not. Um, but I, I very seldom know who the bad guy is. And I'm struggling with that right now as I write the Mrs. Rizzoli book. I know that Angela has seen a crime and I know that a crime has been committed, but I have no idea who did it. Um, and that has always been the case. Um, I always get writer's block about halfway through the story because I don't know what happens next. Um, and I walk away from it and then and just wait till the answer comes to me. And that's been true for 28 books. So, uh, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm too old to change my technique right now. Um, I, the only other routines I have is, you know, coffee, just lots of coffee and, um, uh, and try and take a long walk every day. We have an, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I'm going to this. I think uh, serial killers are really not that interesting and uh -huh. mysteries are more interesting. And I think you are putting in the medical aspect of it um, makes the book more grounded and fascinating to read. Well, thank you. Um, you know, what, what is it about a story that gets to me? What is it? Um, I think this is always interesting. When does a story begin? What, what is the thing that, you know, really um, starts it in my own mind? And what I remember about the surgeon was I was, I was on book tour for a book called Gravity, which is actually about the space program, has nothing to do with crime. Um, and a woman asked me from the audience, she said, um, I'm not interested in space. I want you to write a book about something I am interested in. And I said, what's that? And she said, serial killers and twisted sounds. <laughs> so that was why I wrote the first serial killer book, is that a, a reader asked me to write a book about serial killers and twisted sex. And the best part about the story is um, I asked her what she did for a living. And she said, she teaches. And I said, what do you teach? And she said, the third grade. So I went home thinking about third grade teachers um, and serial killers <laughs> and twisted sex and, and um, wanted to put a medical twist on it because that's what, I, that's what I was known for. And I thought, what is it about medicine that freaks me out as a patient? Um, what bothers me? Um, and I thought about blood. You know, we all have a, a, a really, I think a very visceral reaction to the sight of blood. Um, and I imagined, you know, you hand over your blood, you go to the doctor and somebody takes a blood test and what happens to that tube of blood? Where does it go? That's the most intimate thing you're going to hand over to somebody. Um, and what if there's somebody in a lab who's getting all these tubes of blood and deciding that because of something about your blood test, you are his next victim. So that's how it all tied in with medicine is that I was just thinking about blood and, and how many secrets you re reveal by handing over a tube of your own blood. Um, we have a couple more questions that have come in through chat. We can just switch back and forth between a mm -hmm. chat one and then if people want to come in. Um, so someone, uh, Cheryl said that, uh, I understand you started as a physician and then turned to writing full time. It seems there are quite a few physician authors. Do you agree? And if so, to what do you attribute the link between medicine and writing? Um, well, first of all, there are a lot more lawyer writers. So it's, <laughs> um, and in terms of, 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 I think the thing about doctors is that we have access to some really dramatic things in life. We see people at their very happiest and at their very saddest. I mean, we, you just, you go into a hospital, just working in a hospital and seeing people dying and seeing mm -hmm. families. Um, these are emotions that you, you never forget. And I think that's part of it is that we as physicians are witness to so many um, stories. I mean, really heart-wrenching stories. Um, 
as far as being writers, I'm not sure there are more novelists who are doctors than there are, say, school teachers or librarians. Um, and in some ways, I think doctors actually have a harder time becoming novelists because we're so taught in the scientific method. Um, we're taught to write in the passive voice. Uh, you know, you look at surgical notes and the doctor's going to write an incision was made. Um, that's not what you do as a novelist. You're going to say he cut the skin. So um, Michael Palmer, and I don't know, I'm sure many of you remember the wonderful Michael Palmer, who was a medical thriller author and who passed away. He and I used to teach a course for medical doctors who wanted to become novelists. And we did that for about 12 years. Um, and each year we would have like 60 to 120 um, medical doctors come in to um, to take this course. To, they all wanted to become the next Robin Cook. And so we were we really got to know the, pro, the specific issues that medical doctors have when it comes to writing novels. As I said, we're taught the scientific method. Um, we are taught to be objective and really to kind of suppress your emotions um, when you're doing patient care. Um, and that's just the opposite of what novel writing is all about. It's really all about getting in touch with your emotions and you know and 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 working with that and trying to understand people not from the physical aspect of them but really what is their emotional inner life um so yeah i think there are doctors who are writers i think um we have a great deal of of access to stories but i'm not sure there's more of us than any other profession someone also wanted to comment that michael Crichton was a doctor too and a writer yes and robin cook um, and there are, I mean, but these are, these are like really big names. I mean, there are tons of lawyers who also write too. The advantage that lawyers have is that lawyers write for their job. I mean, that's what they do. And they are, I, you know, I hope there are not any lawyers in there because I, I have very good friends who are lawyers, but I like, as, as we doctors like to say, lawyers are paid to lie for a living and that's why they're such good novelists. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Um, oh. I got a question. Um, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, I'm Amy. I'm actually calling from Taiwan. And um, I'm really curious about, uh, for example, like I noticed, for example, like in um, the writing, sort of like the writing structure, like in the surgeon, um, the singer, the sinner and the harvest. And then, for example, like in the surgeon, it feels like there's almost like a dialogue, like between the murderer and the victim while or like the man um, storyline. And while, for example, like uh, in the harvest, there is um, sort of like a, I guess, like a shift, almost like a shift uh, perspective, like between like the ship and also what's happening like in the hot, uh, uh, in the harvest, there's like a shift between the shift of perspective between what's like uh, on the ship and what's like in the hospital while like, the sinner, it feels like it's almost like connected, like each chapter is connected and just goes on and on and on. And I just wondering like, what's your, uh, I guess, how, how do you decide like this? How did you decide the structure? And um, did you um, decide like when you write it or are you sort of like, um, I guess, restructure them like after you finish everything and what, uh, what that you made those decisions? Well, you know, what starts off a story off very often is a voice. It's a character's voice talking to me. And when that voice is really powerful, I want to stick with it. So as you'll notice the surgeon, there's a lot of first person um, interior monologue by the killer, who I'll just say is, his name is Warren. And it's written that way because that's how he came to me. Um, he came to me because he was, um, he was speaking to me. And very vividly, and I knew that, first of all, that he was an intellectual person. He was very intelligent. He was interested in history. Um, and I just, at times, I felt like I was taking his dictation, which is really kind of a scary thing when you've got a killer in your head talking to you. Um, so that is, that is why there's so much of first person of Warren. Um, in Harvest, a great deal is told from the point of view of a 12-year-old boy, a Russian boy who, um, who has no arm. And again, it was just um, this little boy started talking to me. And maybe it became so vivid because at the time my son was 12. And so I was very familiar with what, how 12-year-old boys think. And, um, <laughs> and so it, it felt like a child that needed to tell a story. Um, as far as structure, um, I, I find that most of the time I use 
shifting points of view, no more than three points of view in a book. Um, that tends to be a rule of mine, but there, but I break it all the time. I mean, I do have books that are purely told from first person, just the shape of night is, is told, um, you know, from uh, mostly from first person. So um, that's, I think that that's just the, the, the kind of thing that happens on the fly. It's the kind of story that just, just begins and that's, that's the way you want to, you want to tell it. Um, I don't, as I said, I'm not very intellectual about my storytelling. I'm very much more emotional. I'm very much more driven by who's talking to me and what the character wants from me. We have um, another question in um, chat uh, anonymously. Uh, who, or do you use actual cases as a basis for your books? Sometimes. Um, maybe not the basis, well, okay. As, as an example, um, Body Double. Um, Body Double's about um, a family of serial killers. It's about Maura Isles discovering, Maura Isles, first of all, is an adopted baby. She doesn't know anything about her birth parents. And in um, Body Double, she discovers a really terrible secret. She finds out that she's the child of serial killers. And that may explain partly why she's so focused on dark things and on murder and death. Um, but that was based on a true story out of Oregon. It was um, somewhere in the Portland, Oregon area. Um, there was a young man who called the police and said, um, my father just attacked my girlfriend. I want, to I want to report him. But I also want to report that I think my father is responsible for the disappearance of girls in the neighborhood. So the police go and they dig up the father's backyard and they find, they find the dead girls. Um, and that's, I mean, that's bad enough. But then it turns out that the father of the killer was imprisoned for also killing girls and burying them in his backyard. So you have a grandfather and a father who are both serial killers, who've both done the same horrible things. And that's, that's interesting enough, but for me, I think I was, more, I was more focused on that, on the grandson. What is it like to know that you come from this really f horrible bloodline? What is it like to, to wake up and think, my father and my grandfather both murdered little girls and put them in the backyard? Um, what does that do to your own image of yourself, um, your, your thoughts about your own future? Will you become a monster as well? And that was um, what inspired Body Double. Um, it's just that whole idea of family of murderers and what does it do to the innocent in the family? If there are no, I can, I can. I, I have, there's <laughs> there's um, two more in chat, but I was just, waiting if somebody wanted to. Okay. I, I'll come up with, I have another question for you. I'm just curious in these times of pandemic, if, if your mind is starting to work around fill, fitting that into a, a future plot. <laughs> you know, that, that is a really good question because I think, I think a lot of us writers are avoiding <laughs> pandemics because yeah. we feel that this is a temporary thing and it's going to really date the book um you know by next year or two years from now the pandemic will be over and then you're writing a story about the pandemic and it feels like it's going to be a historical novel mm -hmm. so um i i am writing as if the pandemic is not occurring but you can't help i mean every time i have my character shake hands i'm thinking no no you can't do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it's really a bad idea, but I I want to write as if life is carrying on because otherwise it feels it's going to feel dated. Thanks. Um, there was a, a question from Charlotte it said, "What was your inspiration behind playing with fire?" Loved reading oh, it, but felt quite different from all your other books. Absolutely different because it came from a different place. Now, playing with fire started because I was. Um, I was celebrating my birthday in Venice, um, and it was, a, it was a, what a wonderful place. Uh, but one night while I was there, I had a nightmare. And the nightmare was about, I dreamt that I was playing my violin. I'm a, I'm a really, truly amateur violinist. And um, while I was playing my violin in this nightmare, there was a baby sitting next to me. And the baby's eyes suddenly glowed red, and she turned into a monster. And I woke up and thought, what does this mean? I mean, music and babies and monsters. Um, I was, it was really kind of a frightening, a frightening story. Uh, but I thought there's a novel in here, but I don't know what it's, what it is. It's a, it's a novel about music having the ability to turn children into monsters. So I walked around Venice that day and I ended up in the old Jewish quarter. 
And there are these um, memorials to the 246 Jews from Venice who were deported and almost all of them were killed in Nazi death camps. And one of the memorials is this wooden plaque that just has names and, day, uh, and ages. And very at the, at the bottom, there's this whole collection of one family, I think, um, that you could, it seemed like there was this one family that went off to, to die. And I thought, that's, that's my story right there. What happened to that family? So this, the way the book came about, it's, it's about a, a woman violinist in contemporary times who buys an old piece of handwritten music uh, in an antique store, Rome. And she takes it home. And every time she plays that music for, on her violin, her three-year-old goes crazy and, and does something really violent. Um, and she begins to wonder whether there's something evil with the music. Uh, is, and she wants to find out more about where, who this composer is. And she tracks the composer his past back to Venice where he, where he was living. And in alternating scenes, I also show 1940s Venice. And you look at the composer as a young man um, and how he comes to write this music called Incendio. So I had to describe this, this piece of violin music. Um, it didn't exist, it was purely in my imagination. And I describe it as being very difficult to play, a beautiful waltz that becomes more and more disturbing um, as the music goes on. Um, and it, I think I was describing that music so vividly that halfway through the writing of the story, I had another dream. And when I woke up, I had the melody of this fictional piece of music in my head. And since I played the piano, I was able to right away, you know, play the piece of music and I was able to compose the violin and piano part in a, in a couple of weeks. So here are two different dreams. One dream was about the story of this mysterious piece of music. And the second dream was the music itself. Um, and there's a, this, a really weird kind of confluence of things that I, I don't, I still can't understand. Um, a music producer, a friend of mine, I, I sent him the music and he said, I, I know just the violinist who can perform it. So um, he brought in a violinist named Suzanne Howe, who was a concert violinist who was living in Paris at the time. And I remember she called me and she said the first time she was practicing this music, she had her windows open and people in Paris had stopped on the street below to listen to it. Um, so she recorded the music and, um, and it was, and if you've read Playing With Fire, you can find the music on YouTube. Um, it's called Incendio. Um, and here's the really weird thing about it. In the story, I wrote that the composer plays a violin that was built at a certain year in Cremona, Italy. And after Suzanne recorded the music, she read my book and she called me and she goes, this is really weird. This music that I played was recorded on a violin that was made that, that exact year in Cremona. <laughs> so um, all these things that came from, from dreams to mysterious music to all these coincidences, I, I almost feel like that, that book was a gift to me um, from some, I don't know, somewhere beyond. Um, someone asked, will Warren Hoyt appear in new books because he's not dead yet? <laughs> he's not, yeah, the television show killed him off. And I think that was a terrible idea. I don't know why they killed him in the show um, because I thought Warren Hoyt was one of my most interesting characters of all. He's still alive. I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I haven't found a way to bring him back yet. And, and in a sense, bringing him back feels almost like a gimmick. Um, so I may not, but just know that he's there and he's in prison and he's still thinking of terrible things. <laughs> that was it with questions from the chat, but people are more than welcome to um, uh, unmute themselves and ask questions. So. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to circle back to that question people asked, has, have your stories been based on real um, cases? Sure. Um, and not necessarily the main story um, of, I mean, the central plot of the mystery, but I often use um, real forensic cases to, I guess, to enrich the story. One of them was in um, The Apprentice, if you remember that there's an opening scene that really has nothing to do with the story, but I was so fascinated by the true crime or the, the true nature of it that it went in there. And it's a little mystery that happened in real life down in Miami. Um, the neighbors of this, this, it's a residential neighborhood, heard this loud noise um, and they woke up very early in the morning and they went outside and there was a body lying in the street. 
And this body was really badly damaged. I mean, so badly damaged that the top of the skull had, had flown off and fell in somebody's flower pot. And, and um, the body was terribly mangled. And they thought, wow, he was, must have been hit by a huge truck. And they even found what looked like tire tracks on his, on his shirt. Um, and, but the, the really strange thing about it was that there were no skid marks. They couldn't find glass. They couldn't find any, any evidence of a vehicle. Um, and until the investigators reached down and realized that what they thought were skid marks over his shirt were not at all. They were, it was actually grease. It was some kind of, some kind of uh, motor grease. And then at that moment, a plane came in for a landing overhead at the Miami International Airport. And they realized, no, he was not a victim of a traffic accident. He had fallen out of a plane. He was a stowaway who'd stowed in the wheel well. And as the plane came in for a landing, the wheels came down and the body fell out. Um, and I thought that's really a heartbreaking kind of a story, but it's also a really fascinating mystery. And so that, that went into the beginning of The Apprentice where you, it gives you a sense of, of how Jane Rizzoli's mind thinks as you see her putting these things together and she solves the case right there and then she moves on to um, the real case of the story. So I like to take little tidbits out of true crime. I, I subscribe to the Journal of Forensic Sciences and I get a lot of material out of there. Um, they're true crime cases. They also keep me up to date on forensics. Um, what's the latest on fingerprinting analysis and DNA and all sorts of things. So I try to work that in there. Uh, I have a question, if possible. It's Charlotte from UK again. Hi, Charlotte. <laughs> Hello. Um, so, kind of, I noticed that a few of your books have got a bit of a um, kind of a supernatural um, feel to them. Not all of them, but the, a few of them. <laughs> um, and I know that obviously you never necessarily confirm that it is supernatural. There's always elements of, well, actually, it might not be. It might be, yeah. you know, um, something else, much more um, explainable and, and much more kind of, you know part of the mind etc um, do you um, like writing kind of the supernatural stuff or do you prefer kind of some of the more human good and evil plots I like to keep people guessing I mean I don't, <laughs> I, I don't believe in the supernatural at all I, I'm a big skeptic and but even though I, I've been spending all my life looking for ghosts I've never seen one uh, even my, my mother believed in ghosts and she saw a ghost, but I never have. So I think it's always interesting to me that that edge, you know, that, that edge between reality and, and the supernatural and, and making your reader try to decide, is this true or is this not true? Is it the character who's going crazy or is a ghost really in the house? So um, In the Shape of Night, which is probably the closest um, to coming to a supernatural story, um, you're going to ask yourself by the end of the story, did Ava actually see the ghost? Was she actually in love with the ghost? Or is this her troubled mind that's dealing with some terrible, terrible pain and, and with the alcohol that she was drinking every night? Was that um, where the ghost comes from? Um, I love leaving things open at the end so that it's really up to you to decide um, whether there is a supernatural ele element or not. But I have to say, I'm, I've always been... Um, I've always been attracted to the idea. I just never believed it. And, and I love stories that, that, that draw you in thinking that there's a ghost. And then at the end, you find out through logical reasons um, why that can't be possible. Thank you. Christine has suggested that um, yeah. if, if we run out of questions, people could talk about their favorite books of yours, Tess. Sure, it's, it's a mystery book club, so go ahead. <laughs> ask, ask away and really feel free to ask any questions about any specific books. And if I remember, if I remember the answer, I will tell you. <laughs> um, I got another question. Um, I guess, like, how did you come up with, like, um, specific places, you know, like, um, like, a, either, like, a street or, like, um, larger place, like, you know, Boston, like, India, or, um, like, Russia, like, places like that? How did you come up with that? Google Maps. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, you know, Google Street View is amazing for authors, because um, some places I actually go there, and I, and I, and I, and I do the research. For instance, um, with, um, 
the silent girl, there was a great deal about Boston's Chinatown. I walked every single, you know, foot of that, of that neighborhood. I took photos everywhere. I was trying to find out, could you jump from this roof to the other roof? Um, and so that was, that was actually on site uh, research. Um, and with um, my book about the space program, NASA, I, I, went to, I went to NASA. I was on Jan Johnson Space Center. I mean, I, I was very familiar with that campus. But other places where I'm not, you know what, I'm not going to be traveling to Belarus anytime soon, or I'm not going to be going to India anytime soon. So a great deal of it has to do with um, street views, Google Street Views and, and um, Google. I mean, it's, it's, it's a shortcut and it's lazy, but sometimes that's what you have to do. Does anybody else have any favorite books they want to talk about? <laughs> I could also take it off spotlight view if that would help. Um, do you all think that that would help with like facilitating discussion? Well, I, okay, I'm curious what people, what, which books are people's favorites? I mean, whenever, I ask my my readers. They always seem to go back to the surgeon, which it's it's interesting to me. Um, it's funny because authors, I think, very often our favorite books are the ones that sell the poorest. Um, they're the books that we work the hardest on, that we felt most most emotionally invested, and yet um, they're not the ones that others will point to as being their favorite novels. Um, so it's it's always interesting to me to find out what people say. Well, I, I had read the, the Surgeon, and that is the only one I've read at this point, so I need to catch up. I, I'm curious about the TV series and if you felt like those, the characters, the, the casting fit the bill with, with how you wrote the characters. Uh, no. <laughs> <That's>, no. <laughs> um, it, television is so, it's such an interesting industry. Um, when they cast the if you've read, you read it, so you know that Jane Rizzoli is not a good looking woman, okay? She's right. very ordinary. She's, she's in a way, it's kind of a mess, uh, <laughs> not attractive. And when they called me and said they had cast the part uh, with Angie Harmon, I was kind of like startled because Angie Harmon's the six foot goddess. She's, she's absolutely beautiful. And, um, and then they went on to cast um, Maura Isles. And I always envisioned her as being sort of like a really gloomy looking, goth looking Catherine Zeta Jones type. And, mm -hmm. And they cast you know, beautiful Sasha Alexander, who's blonde, and, and they changed her personality. And so um, a lot of it has to do with what they perceive is, gonna, is, is working better on, on television. Mm -hmm. And they wanted glamour. Um, and that's, you know, really American TV is very much like that. If you compare it to British television, for instance, where people actually mm -hmm. look like real people, um, yeah. it's very, very different. And maybe that's why I'm so attracted to, t to, to British television and, and, mm -hmm. and British mysteries. Um, one other thing about Rizzoli and I is that may be of interest to all of you. Um, you know, it went for seven years. It, it was at the top of its ratings on TNT, and then it was dropped. And I'm always asked, why would you drop a top, you know, a hit television show? Um, and the reason I had heard was that it's all about advertising. Who's paying for the advertising? And for advertisers, the prime, um, the prime demographic is they want people who are 20 to 35. They want people that age group watching their ads. And Rizzoli and Isles was capturing a demographic of women who are 45 and older. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was not good enough for them. Even though it was, they were getting great ratings, they were not getting the ad demographic they wanted. So that was part of the reason it went down. And to this day, it still makes me upset. I mean, women 45 and older, we spend money too. So why is it that nobody cares about us? Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's one of these things that you don't even think about when you're watching television and you think, well, you know, this is a hit TV show, but we're not, but the right people are not watching it. Right. <laughs> well, I, I will look for the series too. I'm sure I can find it in the library or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, but of all the, you know, you asked about you know, what, the Brazilian Now series, about the ones that I love that are so different. Um, I loved The Bone Garden, and I know people don't really talk too much about The Bone Garden. It's a historical novel 
Um, and it really goes back to the life of, um, of Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a doctor. This, is the, this was the father of the jurist. Um, and he was the first American to, um, to tell American doctors that you need to wash your hands because so many women were dying of childbed fever back then and the doctors, it was the doctor's responsibility. They were infecting all these women with their filthy hands and Holmes was the first one to say, we need to wash our hands. So um, combining that medical history, that very gruesome medical history with a serial killer novel was how the Bone Garden came about. Um, yeah, and so that was one of my favorites. One of, the other one of my favorites was a book called Gravity, which is about the International Space Station. I loved writing that book. Um, and then Playing with Fire was one of my favorites as well. So these, these are all standalone titles that did not sell as well as my crime novels, um, but they're the ones I loved. I will try. <laughs> some questions that actually just came in chat. Um, uh, someone was curious about how um, Brazilian Isles uh, became a TV show and what input you had into uh -huh. It. I think you touched on it a little bit. But. Yeah, well, it, it's um, like a lot of television shows. It comes out, I mean, I, I had sold, I've sold movie rights to several of my novels, um, to Harvest and to Gravity. Um, and then when I sold the option to Rizzoli and Isles, um, I, I was very dated by that point. I just didn't believe Hollywood was ever going to do anything. So I just kind of cashed the option check and forgot about it. And a year later, um, the producer just came back to me and he said, uh, we've got a really good script and we want to, um, we, we want to bring this to, to, uh, to Warner Television. It was just serendipity. He had been reading my novels and he said, I, I love your girls. That's how he said it. I love your girls and I think they belong in television. And that's how it came about. It's just a, a phone call out of the blue. I, you know, every step of the way of this development of this television show, I th kept thinking it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Just cash the check and walk away because that's the only way to stay sane in Hollywood. Yeah. Not to believe anything good will happen. <laughs> and then when it does, you're pleasantly surprised. So um, as far as um, my influence on the development, the only thing I've done is... Um, they would call me and ask, what would Jane do? Or what would Jane, what, what beer would Jane drink? I think that was one of the questions they asked, what beer would Jane drink? <laughs> um, and they did one episode that was based on a short story of mine. Um, it's the book, the short story was called Jane, uh, John Doe. And it was about Maura getting arrested for the possible murder of her date when she wakes up and she doesn't remember what happened during that date. Um, but other than that, they did, um, they pretty much took it in their own direction. Uh, I can't, I really can't criticize them for what they did because the show was a hit. Obviously, they knew what they were doing, um, became very popular. Um, it was just quite different from the books. Someone also asked, what are some of you, they're glad to hear you love British crime books and TV. Can you share some of your favorite? Oh my, okay, let's start, let's do TV because we're going through them and we, we get to the end of the season and then we're just like we're going crazy. We can't wait for the season to start. Okay, so my favorite right now is Vera. If whoever's there is from England, um, I love the television show Vera. It is, it is, again, what I love about it is that it's about a middle-aged female cop and she's so real and, she, and she's so unglamorous. Um, we love, um, even though it's kind of silly, we do like um, Midsummer Murders. <laughs> it's just been going on for 21 seasons. I can't believe a television show has lasted for 21 years. Um, we have become attached to the characters of Father Brown. And now we're watching um, a, a, a kind of a quirky British show called Death in Paradise, which is about it's a fish out of water. British cops get sent to the Caribbean and now he's, he's the chief of, you know, he's, he's the head of investigations in a Caribbean island, which he hates. He just, he wants to go back to London. So, you know, what, what, what all these British television shows have in common, and it's true for Rizzoli and Isles as well, we fall in love with the characters. You know, the, the mysteries we forget about, who did it, we don't really care. We just care about the characters and, the, and their relationships. And, and that's, that's the fun about Death in Paradise is this fish out of water who hates the Caribbean and goes to work every day in his suit and tie when everybody else is wearing their Aloha shirts. <laughs> I have to say that those are some of the most popular series too at the library. They oh, go really? out all the time, yeah. <laughs> As do Rizzoli and Isles. Yeah, well, we we get we subscribe to BritBox, so 
that's how we get them. <laughs> I think the, there was a, oh, books too. Oh, British books? Oh my gosh, so I just, I just read a book called, by Paula Daly. Um, and I think, I can't remember what part of England she's from. It's called um, Clear My Name. And uh, you know, I love Paula Daly because she plays with time she goes back and forward in time. And so you see the mystery from all different angles. Um, so that was, that, that's the one that's fresh in my mind right now that I'm really, that I'm thinking about. But I think there's something about, oh, and there was a, uh, oh gosh. The thing is, I remember the titles, but I forget the author's name. There was a book called The Nanny that came out not that long ago. The thing about British books, which I love, is that there's very little violence. The ones that I love have very little violence on the page. They're much more intellectual. They're much more cerebral, and is much more character driven. And those are the stories I, I, you know, I would like to. I hope I'm writing, um, and I try to keep the violence off the page in my books as well. And you know, I think a lot of people say, "Oh, your books are so violent," but they really aren't. Um, by the time my characters walk onto the page, the violence has happened, and you are there um, just to understand what what went beyond, what what, what went before. Was that uh, The Nanny by Gilly McMillan? Yes, that's right. I just, I looked it up there. Thank you. <laughs> um, when you're writing, have you ever um, either intentionally or unintentionally just projected yourself onto um, either one or more than one of your characters or you just sort of like just hear what they are saying or just like, I don't know, like describe them from a distance, from a distance? I'm Maura Isles, I, I have to admit, that's me. That's, I mean, she's the one I project the most of myself onto um, because we're both doctors, we both believe in logic, neither one of us is gonna believe in crazy supernatural stuff. So whenever Maura comes on the page, the voice of reason has walked out. I, mean, I think of her as the, as the, you know, the scully <laughs> of Rizzoli and Isles. Um, and she also, the other thing I project from, with her is that I'm kind of a loner myself. I'm not really comfortable with crowds. So I feel that her sense of Asperger's is a little bit a reflection of my own personality. Um, so that's, I project myself on her. Jane Mazzoli, I think would be considered the polar opposite. And so whenever I write Jane, I just think, well, what would I do? Jane's gonna do the other thing. Um, and that's, that's how the characters come about. But in a way, every character that a writer creates has a little bit of them. Um, in that character, which I suppose could be considered scary since I write serial killers. So. <laughs> I have to take this opportunity to thank you so much for just coming and speaking with us. So I just, um, I appreciate you as a colonizer of dreams. You know, you are a creator. I just have to salute you. And I thank you so much for being a creator. That's I would have to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I think um, for those of you who, are, who want to be writers, who want to be novelists, um, I always give a, a, little bit, a little bit of advice here. Number one is don't be an editor your first time through. Just write the story, finish it, and then go back and, and edit. Um, second, wait for that voice to talk to you. Uh, you, you just, it's amazing how powerful that is when an imaginary voice starts to speak to you. And often I find that imaginary voice is someone who's very different from me, either a serial killer or a 12 year old boy. Those are the voices that become the most vivid and really kind of get your story going. Um, so wait to listen to the voice. And third, don't feel like you have to know the answer to everything when you start off your, your book. Um, you'll find it along the way. And some of my best twists have happened right up on the spur of the moment as I'm writing. Well, if we're out of questions. Yeah, does anybody have any, anything else they'd like to say or any more questions? Otherwise we can wrap up. I wish I can very well and ask you a question, but I can't. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can type it too, I think. Yep. I can play violin. Yeah. 
and uh, a small part of incendio. Uh -huh. uh, if you wanna hear, I can play. Oh, it's a really hard piece too. Just the beginning. Yeah, the, it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Do you have your violin there? <laughs> oh, okay. We're gonna get a little concert here. Play the beginning. very much. I, that, that, that's not the piece I wrote, though. Uh, I can't, couldn't find the notes. Oh, you know what? I will send you the music if you, if you um, email my web, my web page. I have the violin music I can send to you. Okay. Thank okay. You. <laughs> sure. Thank you very much for the concert. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was a, that was like an unexpected uh, little treat Sorry? there. That was unexpected treat. Thank you. Hi, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Tess, I just wanted to say a massive thank you um, for uh, you taking the time out today to do this. Um, for us in the UK, it's four o'clock. Um, yep. And uh, I'm halfway through a, a shift. At, I'm actually at work <laughs> on my break. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm you're working, working, you're working. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm keeping a pharmacy going. Um, so this was a lovely little kind of um, midday for me break and a uh, very welcome refresh of the mind. So thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, and keep, on, keep on reading, all of you. <laughs> thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> thank you all for coming and attending today. And thank you, Tess, for... Um, appearing and talking so much and answering everyone's questions. Um, really appreciate it. And thank you, Matt, for, for hosting. It's a, sure. it's a pleasure. And I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but you know, when this is over, maybe I'll finally make it. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> okay. so. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.